Hi. Right. Um, hello. Welcome, everybody. Running over time, so let me just start. Uh, my name is uh, Omar, Omar Mohut. I will talk about growth hacking today in the next hour. Before we're going to do that, let's talk about what's a startup. First definition from Eric Ries. Who knows Eric Ries? Oh, some hands, not a lot, but still, okay. It's a must read if you want to be a startup. His definition is a startup is an institution designed for a new product or a service on the conditions of extreme uncertainty. Why? Because you don't know. You don't know if there's a market for, you have to test it out. It's a new product in a new market. If you are a bakery, you're creating breads, you know there is a market for it. If the bread is okay, you're going to sell. But if you're a startup, you try something totally new. So you don't know the outcome of it beforehand. That's one definition of Eric Ries. Second one comes from Steve Blank. Who knows Steve Blank? Same people, okay. He was a teacher of Eric Ries, um, being an entrepreneur, he's also a professor at Stanford. And for him, he talks about a startup being an organization searching for repeatable and scalable, very important word, business model. That's a second definition of a startup. Let's give you one more, all right? This time from somebody you don't know, myself, right? So definition for me is a startup is making a product or a service. It has an unlimited uplift. You can grow without any limit. The market is the limit. It can really scale very, very fast on a global level. The moment you're online, you're everywhere. There are 1.5 billion people connected with broadband now. And lastly, it can grow without depending only on people. A small team can serve a very, very big market. That's new. It never happened before in the history of humanity. Now, how come? I think there are three important conditions, requirements, to be really that scalable as a startup. The first one is it has to be based on intangible assets. Think about uh, music or movies, but also software or a brand or a patent. All these things are intangible assets. The second condition is you use technology to lever that asset. Let me explain. A thousand years ago, you had people here around singing, making music. Back then, music was not scalable. You go somewhere, in a village, on a market, in a castle, you play music and you get paid for your performance. That's it. About 100 years ago, somebody, Thomas Edison, managed to record music. He made gramophone. So you can record music. Technology made music more scalable, which means if you record once the music, you can sell it to a lot of people all over the world. That's what happened with music. One last condition. You use internet for free distribution. MP3, in combination with internet, was killing the music industry. So to have an asset like music or anything else, make technology to lever it and get you free distribution. If I tomorrow create a factory to make this bottle of water, okay, challenging, but possible. Yet, I still have to figure out distribution. The logistics, the transportation, to bring it to the shops, to put it on the shelf, to sell it, to warehouse, the whole thing. If I have to export this water to Australia, it's a hard job. Paperwork, customs, the whole thing. In your case, if you apply that, it costs you nothing. It's a free right. Okay? So you should use that. It's a big, big opportunity. The impact of these three perfect storm elements means that today a small team can do miracles. I mean, the speaker before me was talking about WhatsApp. Any idea how big WhatsApp is as a team? What do you think? Nobody. Then, a bit more, about 50 people serving 400 million users. Let's take another one, Instagram. How big is Instagram? About 10, 13 people serving, what, like half million pictures every day? Let's take an example in Belgium. If you take Belgacom, big player, telecom player, they have 15,000 employees. 
if every person in Belgium is calling each other, it's like six million calls, right? Now, if you take Skype, also doing calls, Skype is 1,400 people working there, employees, in Luxembourg, the US, and in Singapore. It's 10 times smaller. Yet, tonight, during peak time, they're handling 70, 70 million calls at the same moment. You see scalability? It's huge. Why is that? Because the real constraint for anyone is human beings. At the end of the day, even if I work really, really hard, 20 hours a day, seven days on seven, it's a limit. If you can decoupling that, then you can become hyperscalable. Also interesting is there is no linear correlation between creativity and number of hours worked. I can work 10 years and create, write a book, and have only one customer, my mother, right? Some of you will do it in a weekend, and you have 10 million copies. Right? There is no correlation, not in a linear way. That's very, very important. It's also a huge opportunity. That's why pricing software is very hard. I mean, you, you guys are creative artists. You're the digital artists of this century, right? Software is a piece of art. How do you price that? Very, very hard because of this reason. And lastly, despite being small, startups have a very big impact in economic value. The value of a designer, even, is so high, it's more than the number of hours he worked on. This is important, because in this world today, we don't appreciate that. There will be no startup in Belgium that will become Gazelle of the Year. Why? Because by definition, it's a small team. While Gazelle of the Year trends, they will count the number of employees. The more employees you have, the more chance you have to be like the company of the year. But a startup is not about having a lot of people. It's about having a small team leveraging a big user base, even globally. No startup in this country will become export lion, right? Yet, let's take Engager in Ghent, here in Belgium. Engager's revenue is 95, 98% export revenue. Why? Because at the end of the day, to be an export lion, the customers have to know that you're exporting things. But Engager is digital revenue. Showpot is digital revenue. How do you count that? Customers don't see this revenue passing by, right? This is why they will never win the export lion. Yet, every startup in this country, everywhere in the world, is an export lion and is a, is a gazella. That's the reason. What about market opportunity for startups? Well, you know Mark Andreessen. The guy said very clearly, 2012, Wall Street Journal, software eats the world. Everything becomes software, which means you guys are in the driving seat. That's a huge thing. There is no software industry anymore. Everything becomes software. It's like last century <coughs> companies, we call them pen and paper companies. It doesn't make sense. This century, every company will use software, right? That's why it's not an industry anymore. It's a huge opportunity. We know how software is eating manufacturing, 3D printing, and uh, robots. OK, that's clear. But also sales. The new land the, the landing page is the new sales guy. If you make a landing page, they convert visitors into email addresses or contracts. That's what the sales guy is doing, contacts to contracts, right? The difference is a landing page costs me $300, right? It can speak 10 languages. It works 24 hours and seven. It can handle a million customers at the same time. No salesman can do that, okay? Software is eating everything out there. It also means you're really in the driving seat. Now, those are just warming up, right? Let's talk about growth hacking. First of all, let me give you a definition. Growth hacking is about acquiring or retaining of customers. Now, you might argue, that's true, but every business is about acquisition of customers and keeping customers, right? Nothing new. But there's a difference. Sorry. The difference is that you're looking for levers, important word, to repeat and scalable growth. Like being a startup is looking for repeatable, scalable growth. It also means that different, you can start from the product, 
guided by data. This is new. We have so much data today. You know what's happening in your SaaS application, in your app? Before, we had no ID. If you sell this bottle of water, you have no clue who's buying it, why he's buying it, what he or she's doing with it. You don't know. You cannot measure that, right? You guys can measure everything. And here's the big thing. Today, the product is a channel. If you change the product, you change your channel. The moment you're online, you have an app or a SaaS product, you are really changing your channel as well. It's unique. It's the first time in history that I know where the product and the channel are the same thing. That's a huge opportunity if you know how to do that. One way to do that is using growth hacking. Now, growth hacker I discovered about um, one year ago. I tried to make the profile. There are three main things you have to know. First, to be a growth hacker, you have to understand marketing, right? To apply marketing. The second thing is, you have to know how to make software, how to make APIs. In my books, if you know this, if you know how to code, you can learn marketing. If you're a software engineer, you can learn marketing. It's much harder if you know marketing to learn this, okay? Then again, I'm biased, I'm a software engineer myself. Having said that, you still need a third thing, data. Really, data. Everything today is data-driven, getting insights. If you combine these three skills, marketing, know how to code, and data, you're in pole position for growth hacking. Now, growth hacking started in the US, like a lot of other things, Silicon Valley. I discovered about a year ago, summer 2013. That's when I started to uh, launch it in Belgium. Growth Hacking Belgium is a meetup group. Not just one, it's the biggest meetup group in Belgium. And I'm very proud of that. Of all the cities, about 75 now, 78, it's like a year ago, Belgium is number three. After Silicon Valley and Paris, is the third biggest meetup growth around growth hacking in the world. So that's quite a nice achievement for this uh, country. Now, typically, People will say, okay, fair enough, but Omar, is it not the same thing as marketing? What's new about it, right? In there? Well, there's a difference. If you're good in marketing, really good, head of marketing, director, VP marketing, CMO, you get a budget, a million euros, and you go and you buy customers. If you can do that, it's an art, you're doing very, very well. But if you're a growth hacker, you don't have a budget. I mean, what do you do? You have to find customers, without the more million dollar budget. That's, I think, more challenging. Don't you agree? Now, how does it work? Here's an important mental picture that you have to remember. If you have to remember one thing of today, that's what you have to remember as a principle. You see, think about marketing, right, as a lever. So if you product, you have the market that you want to move, and you put money there, your marketing budget. The more money you have, the more the market you can move, right? Which is not a surprise. If you don't have this budget over there, what do you do? There are a number of solutions. Number one is called the law of Archimedes. You make this longer. How long? As long as you need to be, right? I think Archimedes said once that if it's long enough, we can move even the planet, right? So you make it longer. How do you do that? You use an EPI. Usually I usually have to explain what an EPI is, but I'm sure I don't have to do it in this audience. Let me show you some examples how it works. Think about these guys, Spotify. Spotify streaming music. Back then, there were like hundreds of startups doing streaming music. Why is Spotify, why you know Spotify? How come? Because these guys, they were really, really good in integration with social media, like Facebook. Every time I listen to a song on Spotify, they will post on my wall, my friends will see it, they want also to listen to it, they click on it, and they become really a user of Spotify. Let's take Instagram. Nobody will ever hear of Instagram. It will be some very small, obscure kind of app used maybe in New York somewhere. But thanks to the integration with Twitter and Facebook, sharing it, it became like who they are today. In other words, if you don't have access to a market, borrow somebody else's market. Access Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, and borrow their market. 
It's also dangerous. One example which is not there is Zynga. They're making games. Zynga became really big thanks to Facebook. But then they start overusing it, spamming people, right? And Facebook killed Zynga. They're still in problems today. But that's how to do it. That's one way to do it. A second way to do that is to make your product viral, to make it grow itself. Like I said before, your product is a channel that's new, it never happened before. So I'll give you an example or two. Take Dropbox. How many people are working for Dropbox in sales? Up to one year ago, Zippo, nothing. Why? Because sales for Dropbox, that's you guys. You are the sales force of Dropbox, all right? You bring in new users and you're getting like incentive for that. Take Skype. I lived in Dubai four years as an executive. 2004, in Dubai, to call was very, very expensive. Even today, it's still expensive. The number two income of the Emirates next to oil was Tileco, right? But fine, we had to call home to Belgium and my wife as well. So I flew from Dubai to Brussels. It's a long flight, right? To go to my parents and to my parents-in-law to install, to buy, install a laptop. To explain to them how to use a computer. To show them how to use Skype. I did all these things because after that point, I couldn't have a free call. My wife could call her parents. I did the sales for Skype. I did the post-sales support, the installation, the training, everything for Skype. Can you imagine? Everything I did for them? That's how you grow viral. Now, virality is something hard to grasp for us. So let me put it in numbers. Imagine that you have a business doing 1,000 euros a month. That's a small business, right? 1,000 is like peanuts every month. And you have the mindset like a growth hacker. Every Monday morning, you get out of bed, you focus on one thing. This week, up to Sunday evening, I will grow what? 1%, okay? So every week, I will grow 1%. That's the mindset, okay? So after four years, if you do that, starting from 1,000 euros revenue every month, you will have something like this, about 8,000. Not bad, but that's not really a business, right? A consultant will make this kind of money. So let's be a bit more ambitious. We will double our effort. We want to grow every week with 2%, right? You double your effort. I know it's easy in the beginning, it's hard at the end. It's about the mindset, the principle. If you apply that to four years, you have a business of about, what, half a million a year? Not bad, it's a lifestyle business, right? But it's a business. Now imagine we go for 5%. We're focusing every single week to grow 5%, starting from 1,000. After four years, you see the impact? You do 25 million. Now we're talking. You're a real business, right? You want to have more? More ambitious people? Cool. Let's go for 7%. 7% over four years gives you a monthly revenue of 1.3 billion. Imagine. Every month, right? Put it in perspective. Microsoft is doing like what? In euros, 15, 50 billion a year? Okay, so you're coming close. To be really close, we have to go one step up. You want to see the next one? 10%. One more thing about 7%. Um, if you want to get into Y Combinator, the most famous startup acceleration program in the world, by Paul Graham, who is a software engineer, by the way, like Mark Andreessen, that's the number you need to have, 7% every week, to be considered to enter the program, not to be selected, right? 7%. If you do 10%, Let's blow it away. You get like, what, 407 billion every month. To put it in perspective, I think the total uh, BNP in Belgium, our, our national debt is about 400 billion. I mean, you blow the whole thing away. Forget Mark Kuke, you know, it's like pennies at the end of the day. That's real business. I know you will not make 407 billion. I understand. But it's the mindset which really counts. Now, moving on. One more thing you can do is... The world changed, guys and girls. You see, today you can really have great services for pennies. If you go to Elance or Odesk, 
you go to Fiverr, you cannot imagine what you can buy for five dollars. Any idea what you can buy for five dollars? It's a lot, right? I mean, it's like a Starbucks coffee, right? 3.7 euros, more or less. I go there every time. Let me see if this works. <laughs> 